Testing. There we go. Okay. Good morning. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and get started. We're so excited that you are here today. I'm Grace Geisler with the Child Advocacy Center. And um, if you didn't know, we write a grant every year with our local DHRs, Henry, Houston, Dale, and Geneva County. And so that's why you're here today. We get funding for this a training every year to... Um, work with our team about best practices for helping children in the community. So um, I know we have some, Julie Lindsay is here, raise your hand. Is Stephanie McKnight here? Jace, Jason Hughes I don't think is here and I, I know Leslie Kelly is not here but anyway thank you. They work very hard to partner with me every year to do this grant so thank you for that. We're very very excited to be able to do this for all of you. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. If you don't know where the bathrooms are, they are down the stairs past uh, the entrance you came in. You just keep walking down the hall and they're on the right. Um, we have drinks over here. I have a little Coca-Cola barrel if you need a drink. Um, we are asking that you try to keep your mask on as much as possible, except when you're eating. Um, we know a lot of you know each other and work together, um, but we are um, trying to follow the protocols as much as possible um, to stay safe. I would hate for anybody to get sick because they came to this training, so we want to make sure that we're wearing our masks as much as possible. Um, we're very excited to have um, Joseph Scaramucci and Jason Lundquist here today um, and talk with us about child sex trafficking and how to help these um, victims of child sex trafficking. So I'm going to turn it over to them and let them explain a little bit more why they're here and uh, the wisdom that they have to share with us today. All right. Thank you, Grace. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jason Lundquist. Uh, I'll just give you a quick introduction of who I am. Uh, I work for the Waco Police Department. I've been a cop for 21 years. I've done all of that uh, at the Waco Police Department. I have a, uh, I was a patrol officer for seven years, and then I promoted to sergeant. I was a patrol sergeant for eight years. I loved street work. I loved being in uniform and driving a police car and chasing burglars. I worked uh, 12 of those 15 years on midnights, uh, and then. I tried out, I, well, for a refreshing change of pace, I, I tried out for our Crimes Against Children Unit uh, uh, supervisor position. My department was so impressed with my investigative and supervisory ability that they gave me the position. And I was also the only one that applied. Um, <laughs> but I found that, to, I've done that for six years. I found that to be my passion. I really, I really enjoy the work that we do. Um, we were fortunate that um, uh, when, when I moved into the position, I moved into it with a couple other detectives, and so we all got to learn together and work cases together. And then about the same time, uh, our, our local human trafficking coalition was forming, and so we got to be a part of the, the um, uh, startup of that. And so it's just been, it's been a roller coaster ride, but if you do this type of work, you know it's wonderful. You make meaningful, impactful change. Um, I work out of a children's advocacy center. My, my department uh, co-locates in our children's advocacy center. Uh, we were talking last night at dinner. We serve six counties through the advocacy center. We're unique in that uh, our center is a CAC, but it's also a rape crisis center kind of combined. So we do adult and child victims. Um, our center does an incredible service. We you know, do the typical 
uh, CAC services, uh, but then they also have an incredible counseling staff. We have a pediatrician on staff. We do medical exams there at the center. Um, our outreach is incredible, um, and it's just an awesome thing to be a part of, and we're going to talk about how great the CAC model is today. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree from Baylor University in political science. Uh, I realized after I went to go work in a children's advocacy center that like most people have letters after their name and have some sort of degree or advanced degree. And I said, well, I should probably go do that. So uh, 2019, I graduated. I got my master's uh, from Tarleton State University in uh, criminal justice, um, which kind of made me a nerd, which is awesome if you do this work because it's, it's neat to nerd out. Um, other than that, I. Uh, um, I, I, my hobbies are fishing and hiking and, and uh, riding a motorcycle. So that's me. Let me give you Joe. My name is Joe Scaramucci. I'm with the Sheriff's Office in, in Waco. I'm a Leo. I enjoy kittens, puppies, and long walks on beaches. Um, no, so I started, uh, I've been in law enforcement about 17 years now. Uh, naturally started patrol doing the, uh, the street beat thing that I thought was like the most amazing deal ever because here I am saving the world. Uh, ridding the world of speeders and people running red lights. Um, moved into criminal investigations back in 2008. Um, did a little short stint doing property crimes because that's the most amazing thing in the world. Left there, moved to dead people and sex crimes. Um, so I spent several years doing every kind of death imaginable and sex crimes. Um, kind of got into trafficking by accident. We decided it would be kind of cute to do a sting one time, so we asked for permission to do it. We didn't have a trafficking unit. We didn't do anything like that. Our sheriff gave the, you know, go ahead and go forth and conquer. So we did, and uh, it was pretty successful. We got really lucky, watched a bunch of people show up thinking they were gonna have sex with children and watch their soul just deplete from their body when they saw my face, um, which is the most amazing feeling in the world other than puppies and kittens. Um, so we did it. We kept kind of evolving and, and moving forward on it. Um, one thing that I know the law enforcement in the room have, you have the, the young ladies or the young men show up and you're like, hey, I'm here to help you. I'm, I'm going to be your savior. And they're like, I don't need help. I'm not, I don't have a pimp. And you're like, yeah, you do. Like, you have a pimp. And they're, no, no, no. He's just, he's my Uber. Um, we were seeing that constantly and we couldn't really get any traction. So we were throwing everybody in jail doing all that. Um, and one day we were like, hey, you know, when we work homicides, um, we don't have victims that cooperate. Like we ask sometimes and they don't tell us the answer. Like who killed you? And they're like, Ugh. Um, So we're like, can we start applying these same principles to anti-trafficking work? Can I build cases without you? Because I kind of don't need you. Um, and we started doing it and it was really, really successful. So I think to date we've identified in excess of 260 or so trafficking victims, um, arrested in excess of about 160 traffickers. Um, and it's just gained a lot of traction. We kind of travel all over the country, all over the world, really uh, walking through these cases, how we do them. Today's really gonna be kind of an overview of what we do. We've tried to make it like a progressive uh, case building type um, deal. A lot of times what we're gonna deal with, uh, the law enforcement are gonna hate me, the service providers are gonna love me, and that's just the way it goes. Um, so we'll really talk through a lot of those. I definitely encourage at any point, if somebody has a question, throw like one of the hand sanitizers at me, whatever it takes to get my attention, just be like, hey, I got a question. We'll stop at any point and we'll walk through them, so. And I, I, th I think it would be easiest for us to kind of understand what, who we've got in the room. Uh, we know who the law enforcement are because y'all are sitting all in the back. Um, but <laughs> but who, who, else, who else have we got in the room? Uh, do we have, um, Forensic interviewers, uh, counselors, advocates, social workers, um, medical nurses, doctors. Okay, cool. Prosecutors. Awesome. Does anybody have any experience with um, juvenile sex trafficking, domestic minor sex trafficking, adult labor, anything like that? Did anybody have any experience you want to share or, or your perception of how it is here in Houston County? Houston County. Houston County. Or wherever you are. Ma'am. Thank you. I can sit down, right? I don't have yeah, to stand yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Coronavirus. I'll back up. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out now. Uh, so I work with survivors and victims, and one of the things that's hardest for me is we can't actually report anything for an adult without their consent. So 
having to continuously work with them until they're actually ready for something to be done has been very difficult. Um, but other than that, it's great because kids are young enough, we can report anything, and uh, adults is just a little bit more difficult. Uh, actually, I do massage therapy. I do rehabilitative work, so I work in between their counselors and any doctors that they see. We find the things that give them trouble, places where they've been hurt that they're maybe not able to talk about, and then I share my notes with their counselors, and then they take care of the psychological aspect later. That's awesome. Yeah, and that, that brings something up, and we, we'll talk about it uh, today, and hopefully it'll start some conversations, but like mandatory reporting, that's when it comes to adults, that's something that we encounter a lot, is when uh, you're violating HIPAA, if, uh, if you get somebody, particularly in an emergency room, and they say, I'm being trafficked, but I don't want to report anything. Um, whereas with a child, man, you can, you can report that stuff all day long, but with adults, it's kind of, I don't know. And I think that's going to take a legislative change, at least in Texas, uh, maybe nationally, to change the law to maybe make that some sort of uh, mandatory reporting. But those are good things to talk about, and, and it all starts you know, with us. Something good that's come from it, though, is my position since it's in between where their recovery houses are. Since a lot of times they'll run away or they'll leave the recovery program, we still have a relationship established. So when they transition from survivor into, again, victim, we still have a connection point. And so there's still a way for them to say, hey, I, I need to get out again and somewhere for them to connect to. But there's also a problem with not having enough places for them to actually go, especially if drugs are an issue. So that that's kind of preventative in our area. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that the problems are the same. <laughs> anybody else? Does anybody have any experience with a survivor or a case or frustrations or something that you want to, uh, you want to share before we get started? Okay. As we go through the day, we've got plenty of time, right? So as stuff comes up, you know, let's talk about it um, because that's how things are going to change. You got any thoughts? We're going to interact a lot. <laughs> yeah. We'll encourage interaction. Yeah, we'll, we'll come to the back. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll let you kind of give a background on what your department does. Yeah, so in our department, I kind of talked on a little bit when we did the, uh, the intro. Um, we do conduct proactive human trafficking investigations. Um, I really encourage that. I think there's, I don't know about what's happening in, in Dothan, Alabama. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that you don't have trafficking victims walking to the police department going, hey, I need help. Is that, is that happening here? Because if so, I want to know what's in the water. Okay, cool. So we have to go find them, right? They're not just showing up, they're whatever. Um, so we do sting operations, just like most agencies. Ours look way different than most agencies, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how we do it, why we do it, the reason we do the things that we do. We do conduct reactive, so obviously if we have somebody show up at the hospital, they're all beat to hell, and they, you know, whatever the case may be, and we start figuring out, hey, we think this is a uh, trafficking survivor, we'll conduct those investigations. So we do both short and long-term investigations. Um, Federal investigations, you name it, uh, we'll, we'll do all of them. Working with partner agencies on trafficking cases, this is one I love because we see very siloed um, investigative practices. And if we really want to be real about it, the reality is most people want to be the man. Like, I want to be the guy. I want to be the one that slaps cuffs and whatever. We have to work together. Um, I do nothing at all, literally nothing at all, without a service provider in the rooms right there with us. I don't go out to go find victims without one of them sitting in my truck. It's just, it's, it's, it's huge practice to, to just bring everybody to the table. Even Waco PD, it's even common for me to, to call Jason and be like, hey, can you start running this? Like I'm driving from some national hotline tip, can you start searching these things? And, and we're all working together. Um, we do provide national and international assistance on any kind of trafficking case. So just as an example, if you guys do come across something and you're like, holy Jesus, what do I got? Um, we're more than willing to help out. We literally help, we fly all over the country helping out with cases. So, you know, obviously Alabama is one of my favorite places, believe it or not. Um, so we're definitely willing to do that. But uh, we do provide all those, any kind of technical assistance. Uh, we're, we're funded to do those things. This is going to be this is going to be a challenge today. Uh, so Joe Joe flies the F-15, and I ride a bike. Uh, but I'll get there. I just 
don't do things as high speed as he does. So I, I supervise our Crimes Against Children unit for the Waco Police Department. We got a great opportunity to tour y'all's training facility last night. That is amazing what y'all have. Um, so my department is uh, about 250 sworn, and we're unique in that we have a dedicated Crimes Against Children unit, uh, which I think is unique for a department our size and a, a city our size. Uh, Waco is, what did we say, about 150, and then you throw the colleges in, it brings the city up to about 175, 180. Um, so I have, a, it's me and six detectives, and then we have one civilian unit, uh, or civilian secretary for my unit. We investigate all offenses committed against a child. A child in Texas is someone that's under 17 years old. That's kind of wonky. Is it like that here, or is 18? It, well, yeah, and, and so Texas is like that, too. The, a child is defined several places under our family code and our penal code and our code of criminal procedure, but for criminal offenses, at 17 in Texas, you're considered an adult. So we deal with everything with children, which is 16 and under, um, and we basically investigate all offenses committed against children. You can imagine what that is. It's mostly physical and sexual abuse. We do a lot of online stuff, and it's trafficking. Um, and you know we kind of differ in what Joe does is we we don't do anything proactive it's all reactive with what we do and it keeps us busy as far as trafficking goes um, and then we do this a lot we provide training either through the department or through the Heart of Texas Human Trafficking Coalition to partners in the community and I think we're real unique in our area I hope if you're not there yet that you get there here in that, man, I don't care who you are, if you call and say, hey, we want some training on trafficking or child abuse, uh, we'll come. And we have trained doctors, lawyers, teachers, students, um, but then we've kind of branched out and trained uh, hotel staff. And um, what are some other unique ones? News media. Yeah. So anybody that calls and asks, you know, we provide training for, and we kind of do that through the coalition. Um, and then in Texas, it sounds like it's the same as here uh, in Alabama. We conduct joint investigations with the Department of Family and Protective Services. So to just give you a background on my unit with the seven, eight people that are there, uh, we get about 1,000 criminal cases a year. And then on top of that, we intake about 2,500 referrals from CPS. Uh, not everything that comes in through CPS is criminal. You know, there's child abuse and then there's criminal child abuse. Uh, so of those 2,500 referrals, probably uh, usually anywhere from another 1,000 to 1,200 get assigned out. So it keeps us busy. Uh, child abuse keeps us busy. And then just, I, I like to give a quick disclaimer. I have to. Um, uh, basically, it comes down to uh, the Waco Police Department knows that I'm here uh, and they're okay with me being here, uh, but I'm not. <laughs> but I'm not representing them or the city of Waco. Uh, I threw uh, McLennan County in here just, just to help Joe out as well. Uh, they know I'm here, but I'm not speaking for them. Um, and another thing too, in some, of the, in some of my presentations, I've got some very limited uh, media that's, that's part of casework. Um, I would just ask that you don't duplicate it. You know, a lot of people like to take photos of slides and stuff. If you want a copy of presentations that we've got, we're usually more than willing to share, um, but I have permission to use the stuff you don't. So just ask if you, if you want to use something that we've got. Uh, you want to take over or you want me to? So, you know, the biggest thing that we're going to talk about, and I hope that everybody has kind of come with this mindset, or if not, when, when we leave, we can have you drinking the Kool-Aid, is that um, the biggest challenge in, in human trafficking, particularly in domestic minor sex trafficking, is that we have to acknowledge that it exists, right? Everybody likes to say that, oh man, that's, we don't, either we have that here or we don't have that here, and it usually all has to do with media reports. Um, and I like to point it out like child abuse. Do I have child abuse investigators in the room? Anybody do just strictly child abuse? Okay. So. So, or, or even if you just work in your CAC, like what do we know about child abuse, right? It's consistent, it's just part of being a human being. If I sit in my office all day and I play solitaire, or if I go out there and my detectives and I arrest everybody that abuses a child, it's still gonna happen. It's still gonna be about 1% of the child population that, that get victimized. And so I bring that up as an example to say, I get a lot of people that will come to me and say, oh man, we've got a problem here because I'm seeing all these news reports about child abuse, and so there must be something bad happening in Waco, McLennan County. Well, the reality is, if you're a practitioner in the field and you know this, you know that 
that doesn't mean you have a problem. That means you have a successful system to deal with the problem. Where you have the problem is where you don't see any, re any things being done, any reports of stuff happening. This, the same is with human trafficking, right? If you have the internet, I usually like to pull out my phone, but it's stuck in my pocket here. If you have the internet where you are, which is pretty much everywhere now, you have uh, some form of trafficking going on in your community, no matter how remote, no matter whatever. Now, um, major sports venues, interstate highways, um, urban populations, of course that increases it uh, and facilitates it, but it's, it's here. It's wherever you are, it's there. Um, so just, you know, the, the hardest challenge that you're going to have to come to as a practitioner but also as a community member is just changing the paradigm to where people say, okay, that exists here. What are we going to do about it? We've got a problem going on. What can we do? Um, so, yeah, so slavery still exists. And then, go ahead, go ahead. my slide. Sex trafficking is sex, right? We're gonna, I mean, that's what it is. It's rape, but it's sexual in nature. So I just wanna throw this out there. There are things, especially in my slides, that contain light nudity. We're going to work some cases. We're gonna walk through some things. You're gonna see nudity. It's the name of the game. If that offends anybody, there's an exit sign. I just wanna throw it out there. I promise I won't drop any four letter words on, pro or on purpose, um, but there's my advisory. <laughs> yeah, mine's, mine's always the same. I am, um, uh, I always love to throw out there, uh, when I, especially when I do classes for college students and then I get the best reaction is I'll come in and I'll say, hey, we're gonna talk about child abuse. And so to talk about child abuse, we have to acknowledge that a couple you know, certainties in life. The first one is that we have the ability to be injured or killed from the moment we're born until the moment we die, right? And everybody will shake their head and they'll say, yeah, that's true. And then I'll say, we have to acknowledge the fact that everybody in this room pretty much has a penis or a vagina and an anus, right? And everybody will go, Ugh. And then that's really great when we talk about why we do forensic interviews later, you know? Um, but like Joe said, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about abuse. We're gonna talk about abuse of children. We're gonna talk about sexual abuse of children. It's not pretty, it's not glamorous, but it happens. And if we want to acknowledge that it happens, we have to talk about it. So. I also like to say too, um, I'm very respectful of the fact that there are survivors. I, I guarantee, I know from the statistics that there are survivors in this room. I know from the statistics that there are probably alumni of some foster care system somewhere in this room. Um, if I say anything that is a trigger or particularly impactful for you, or we do, um, you know, feel free to give to give feedback or criticism. I really have gotten some of the best stuff in presentations after the presentation from somebody who says, "Hey." you know, that, that might have happened to me, and either you said this and it was really good, or you said this and it really ticked me off. I want to hear that stuff. That's great. Okay. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll jump into my nerd out, and then we'll, we'll move on to Joe. But the biggest, I, we're going to get boring, and then we're gonna, or I'm going to give you some laughs. So I know it's early. I hope everybody's had their coffee, but we'll try and start off on a light note. All right. But what we talked about, everybody has to acknowledge that abuse exists. Everybody has to acknowledge that, that, um, that trafficking exists. So let's understand how our thought processes can be our own enemies against us. Um, so I, I like to talk about implicit bias. Now implicit bias is a buzzword today. Um, does anybody kind of have a concept of what implicit bias is that they'd like to share? Because it really does help if, if we kind of collectively come up with this definition of what impl implicit bias is. No, but I'll volunteer somebody. Joe, what do you think implicit bias is? But you've seen this before, so don't give it away. Oh, I think it's when we have a predisposed notion about what something is and we, I don't know, as law enforcement tailor our investigation around that. So I just see that you're, as an example, uh, you're a, a minor prostitute. Um, therefore, I don't have to really take much of what you say into account because you're just a troubled child. Anybody else in another context? So it seems today that the big conversation about implicit bias is like related to um, kind of law enforcement, kind of race relations in this country, right? And that's, it, it all fits into the same paradigm. And so let's go through this and keep that in mind. But we're gonna talk about it in the context of trafficking and child abuse. Um, and I, Everything that I give today is going to be from the flavor of child abuse and sexual assault because that's kind of my discipline, that's what I do. Uh, but all of that applies to sex trafficking. Can, does anybody disagree that um, sex trafficking involves sexual assault? 
See, we're already ahead of the game. We can break for lunch already. Uh, <laughs> Uh, does anybody, you know, disagree that, that sex trafficking is probably going to, the majority of it involves children? Okay, good. All right. Awesome. I'll, we're, we're, we're ahead of the game. So in Texas, I have to give you my, um, my goals so that we can get credit. And I don't know if it's like that here in Alabama, but these are truly, these are truly my goals for what I'd like you to learn in maybe like the next hour or so is that I want you to learn the concepts of epistemology and implicit bias. We're going to recognize how these concepts can be challenges in child abuse investigations, in sexual assault investigations, in trafficking investigations, honestly in family violence investigations, any type of person crime, uh, bias can come into play. And then um, I want you to explore ways that we're going to overcome these challenges. So what I want you to become is what one of my grad school professors told me that I was, and I was like, wow, that's awesome, I like it. Uh, but I want you to become a pracademic, right? Um, if you've, for the law enforcement in the room, I'll tell you, um, I feel blessed that I went back and got a degree in criminal justice because I had been a cop for 20, almost 20 years when I started my grad school. And I went back and all these things that I was like, man, I know this, you know, I know this through my training and experience. And then I learned like, wow, there's research on this. Like, this is not some stuff that I made up with in my head. There's, there's actual smart people who figured this out long before me. Um, and, and so uh, the more we can apply science and research to what we do, the more efficient we can be. Um, so being a pracademic is really cool. And I think after we get done with this, everybody will be a pracademic. So why is bias important? Uh, has anybody watched, there's a series on Netflix called Unbelievable? You've seen that? It pissed you off, right? Yeah. I couldn't get through two episodes because it made me so mad. I mean, Unbelievable is pretty, it's pretty dramatized, it's pretty sensational. But if you don't have the day and a half to binge watch it on Netflix, there's a podcast on This American Life, I think it's episode... It doesn't say it there. It's like episode 352, and it's called The Anatomy of a Doubt. And I'll give you the cliff notes on The Anatomy of a Doubt, but you can Google it. You don't have to pay for it. It's about 45 minutes. It's totally worth the listen, and it, it interviews the real players in the game. So here's the cliff notes on this. 18-year-old um, girl, she was a uh, graduate of the Washington State foster care system. Uh, you could say she was a troubled kid. She was the victim of a home invasion uh, sexual assault. Guy broke into her house, tied her up, uh, raped her over several days, took photographs of the rape, took photographs of her with her driver's license on her chest while she was naked, and then left her tied up in the home and, and um, uh, didn't kill her. So she reported this. She, the first person she reported it to was her foster mother. You know, her foster mother had dealt with her her whole life as she was a troubled teenager, and she didn't believe her. Uh, so the foster mom didn't believe her, so when they reported to law enforcement, the law enforcement came in with the bias, and they didn't believe her. And um, I'm not going to give away the whole story, but ultimately law enforcement arrested her for a false report. Uh, she recanted, and they arrested her, and the case was never prosecuted. I think about three years later, the FBI was investigating a serial rapist outside of Denver, Colorado. And when they ran a search warrant on one of the suspects, or on the suspect's home, they uncovered a bunch of digital media storage devices, and on one of those devices, guess what they found? They found the photographs of the victim in Washington exactly as she had described. And so um, people had to eat a lot of crow, and they had to go back and do a lot of fixing. And I listened to this podcast. It scared me. It scared me because I thought, man, I don't want to be that guy. Now, there were two detectives involved in that case. One of them he wouldn't interview, um, and obviously there was legal ramifications of what had happened and there was litigation that was proceeding but one of the detectives in the case would interview and he did interview for the podcast and that's where I think the podcast is better than the Netflix series um, and they asked him in the interview kind of you know you're not you don't look good this is not making you look good coming in and talking about all the mistakes and the failures that you did how your bias you know messed with your investigation why are you here doing this and in that in that interview I don't want to quote him exactly, but he basically said, Man, I screwed up and I don't know how to make it right. So whatever I can do to make it right, I'll do it. And this is just one of those things. And I, what I took from that is, I don't ever want to be that guy. 
I don't ever want to be that person who comes in and says, I'm so sure of something, and then have it come back and be wrong. And I sure as heck don't want to be so sure of something in something as serious as that that's going to impact somebody's life forever. So keep that in your mindset when you go through this. And like I said, um, when you leave here, if you want to listen to this, I think it's totally worthwhile. It'll, it'll change your thought on a lot of things. Okay, but so what is epistemology? Does anybody, is anybody a nerd that, like me that has experience with this, with this word? Nobody's, this is the first time for everyone? I love that. Okay. Um, so it's a very big word. And it's, it's my favorite $5 word. Um, but when I learned it, when I learned it as an investigator, I said, this explains everything. This explains everything and what I'm trying to explain. And if I could just get people to learn it too, then the world would be right. So that's why I'm here. Um, but what is epistemology? It is, the definition of it, is the theory of knowledge, especially with regard to its methods, validity, and scope. It's the investigation of what distinguishes justified belief from opinion. Now we can see how that's got to be important as any service provider, but particularly as an investigator. So when I nerd out and I want to learn what something is, I usually try and look for an antonym of it. I try and look for what's the opposite. So the opposite that I believe of epistemology is ontology. So ontology is the theory of what is, and epistemology is kind of the theory of what isn't. More importantly, it's how do I know what I know, and I don't know what I don't know. Um, and if you walk out of here saying nothing but that, you've learned about epistemology. Um, so it gets really deep. By the way, if you Google epistemology Stanford, Stanford University has like a paper that they constantly update. It's got to be 50 pages long. And if you just want to go to sleep real quick, go Google it and start reading it. But it does explain this in very academic terms. So this is deep. So let's say some I am statements. Now, an I am statement is something that we know to be true. Okay, so for me, let me show you the, the difference. For me, when I make an I am statement, when I think of an I am statement, this is me. <laughs> but all I have to do to show that this is not true is look in a mirror, right? Or take a picture. So what are some I am statements that we can say right now that we know are true? I'll start something simple. I am breathing air. Does anybody else, let's get a couple more. Give me some more I am statements. Just yell them out. You are a woman. Come on, guys. It's not that early. In the back, red shirt. I am a black woman. Anybody else? I am on planet Earth. I am wearing shoes. I have a blue blazer on. Anybody? Ma'am? <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> you see what I'm getting at, though, with the I am statements? Like, we can say these and we say, that's true. There's no doubt of that, right? I mean, all I need to know that you're redheaded is to look at you. You know, all I need to know that you're a woman is. is is to say you're a woman, you know, to see that you're a woman. All I need to know that I'm wearing a blue blazer, breathing air on planet Earth in the state of Alabama, uh, holding a microphone. I mean, these are 100% these are certainties, right? Anybody disagree with that? Okay, so the, the concept of epistemology is like a philosophical construct, and it gets really, really deep. And if you go read that Stanford article, this is where it'll put you to sleep. But we say these things with certainty, but do, we don't know what we don't know, right? And so we don't know... There's this concept called brain and vat. And so we don't know is that there could be some mad scientist out there who has your brain and he has it in a vat of liquid hooked up to some computer. And that computer is telling your brain that you're a redhead and you're a woman and I'm wearing a blue blazer and that we're in Alabama. And that in reality, you're just, you know, a brain in a vat of liquid. So we don't know that. So in reality, all of the things that we just made as certain I am statements, we're pretty sure, but we're not 100% sure. Everybody, everybody following along? Okay, all right. So that's crazy. Give me an example, right? Of, of how, what is this in practice? Like, obviously, we're not a brain in a vat, even though we don't know that. I'm pretty darn sure that I'm not, you know? Um, give me an example of epistemology in the real world. Uh, everybody know who this guy is? Somebody want to yell it out? He's, he's first. Who? Christopher. Christopher Columbus. Who knows what Christopher Columbus did in 1492? 
He sailed the ocean blue. There we go. Everybody woke up. Okay. Christopher Columbus, 1492, sailed the ocean blue, and he found the new world, right? So Christopher, during his time in 1492, this was the epistemological limitations of what the world was. The world was flat. Uh, they lived in Europe, and they wanted to go to Asia. And you had only two choices to go to Asia, right? You could take the land route, which I guess took a while and was hard, um, or you could get in a boat and you could leave Europe and you could make a left, go around the Horn of Africa, real bad, seasick, uh, dangerous. And so, but those were your two choices if you wanted to go to Asia. So Columbus, he, he had gone through the IM statements and he said, you know, nobody has left Europe and made a right. Um, and so I would like to try because I don't know what's gonna happen if I do that. And um, everybody said, no, you can't do that. The world's flat, right? So Columbus was Italian. He went to the Italian monarchy. The Italian monarchy were limited by their epistemology. Does anybody remember what the Italians told Columbus? They told him no, they laughed at him, right? So um, Columbus, he said, no, wait a second. I don't know what I don't know. I, I know about this concept called epistemology and um, I still want to try. If I fall off the earth, I fall, if I fall off the earth, I fall off the earth, but I still want to go try because I don't know what I don't know. So Columbus went to the Spaniards. What did the Spaniards do? They said, man, we got three ships. I've seen the matrix. I know what happens when you take the, the blue pill, the blue pill. I think it's the blue pill. I screwed this up and I screwed this up and it was in an eval. Somebody like wrecked me. They're like, hey, took the wrong pill. But <laughs> anyway, the Spaniards had taken the pill. They said, sure, here's three ships. Go give, it a, go give it a shot. And so Columbus left. This made him happy. He left. He left Europe. Uh, he made a right. He sailed across the ocean blue. He landed on a, 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 a landmass and he encountered dark skinned people. Who did he encounter? Who are these people? Native Americans. Oh, somebody said it. What do we call them for 400 years? Indians, right? We called them for 400 years. We called them Indians. Why did we call them Indians? They weren't Indians. They were a completely different race of people. He was on a completely different continent. But Columbus was still limited by his epistemology that he thought, man, I have sailed across a water mass. I have landed on a, a land mass. I have encountered a dark skinned people. I am in India because that's where I plan to go. Everybody kind of follow along and tracking how that's, that's our epistemology. So what is it, right? It's a tool. It's a form of skepticism. It, it allows us to question, do I really know what I think I know? And this is super important when we start talking about uh, victim investigations and trafficking investigations, because I'll tell you, in my time, you know, being a sex crimes and child abuse investigator, I found out that I don't know a lot. I think I do, and I thought I knew a lot when I came into it, and I was wrong. I was wrong, wrong. Um, so, but most importantly, what don't I know and how does that impact my investigation? So we said there were no child abuse investigators in this room, but there are people who have done child abuse investigations, right? All right, if you know this, I want you to raise your hand, but I don't want you to yell it out and give it away. But who knows the correlation between these two photographs? I've got a pair of socks and a pot of boiling water. Does anybody understand the correlation between the two of those? Okay, well, there are people in this world who are really mean, and that's the politest way I can describe them because we're doing this live on Facebook, I think. But there are people in this world who are really mean, and they will, uh, they will discipline their children by dipping their hands or feet into hot or scalding water. And it will cause an injury that looks like this, which in the child abuse world we call, we call a sock burn, okay? Now, if you were limited by your epistemology because you didn't know what a sock burn was and you didn't know that there are evil people in the world who will do this to children and you got called as a, as a CPS or an advocate or law enforcement to the hospital and you saw a child with these injuries, how would you explain it? I mean, how would you explain it? You would come up with what you can conceptualize in your mind, right? And so you would say, well, maybe somebody spilled hot water on the kiddo or maybe the kiddo fell into hot water, or maybe the kiddo ran through hot water, but you wouldn't say what really happened, which is that some evil person dipped this kid into hot water 
because they're mean and ugly and they've, they've, they've injured this kid horribly, right? So can we see how that really impacts us as, as investigators, as people who respond to person's crimes? That if we don't know something, if we can't even think about it, we might be wrong, wrong, wrong. But if we can acknowledge the fact that we don't know everything, that'll put us ahead of the game. Um, all right, so I showed you pictures of child abuse. I've got to make you laugh now. Uh-oh, we got no sound. Oh, I didn't plug it in, that's why, hold on. Hold on. Oh. It feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop they... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like there's this achy, I don't know what it is and I'm not sleeping very well at all, and all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. <laughs> Ow! Oh, come on, Ow. if you would just- Don't! Try to see things my way. Do I have to keep on talking? Counselors? counselors in the room? Y'all ever deal with this? Has anybody ever dealt with a meth addicted victim? Right? Nobody's ever dealt with a victim that's addicted to meth? Yes, okay, Every, let's, let's acknowledge, if you're a cop, you know people that are addicted to meth. And if you deal with victims, you know people that are addicted to meth, okay? But I mean, this, this, it kind of highlights, like I've never, I've never fortunately been addicted to meth. So I don't know what I don't know. And I don't know how hard it is to get off meth. And how many times do we go in, like as law enforcement, I remember telling victims this all the time, like, well, you know, your life would be better if you just stopped doing meth, you know, and that's easy to say, but I don't know how hard it is to do. Um, so anyway, we have to think about that stuff. All right, let's move on to bias. This is, this, this was my mom. Right? My mom believes everything that's on the internet uh, just because it's there. And everybody has somebody like that. Um, and honestly, I think it's about 75% of the people on the internet anyway. Um, but let's talk about bias. So what is bias? Bias is not a bad thing. Usually when we talk about bias, we talk about it in a negative light. And we're kind of going to talk about negative bias here today. But bias is just natural. Everybody has bias. Every living being has bias. Every, you know, um, it's just a prejudice of one thing over another. And so if I was to come around to you and I gave you a bowl of vanilla ice cream and a bowl of chocolate ice cream and I told you that you could only have one, you would pick one over the other. And you would pick it based on your bias, you know, and unless you are the heir to a vanilla fortune or you had a family member killed in a horrible chocolate factory accident, like your bias is just kind of because, because that's what you like and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but there are different types of bias. Uh, this slide is horrible and everybody tells me I should take it out, but every one of these on the wheel is a different type of cognitive bias. So I show this just to show that there are hundreds of different types of biases, right? Some of them are bad, some of them are good. Some of them aren't bad or good, but they can just really impact us and we need to be aware of them. Um, so some of these that can impact us are like confirmation bias. This is real easy. We agree with things that are agreeable. This is the internet all day long, right? You know, if I've got 100 likes on something, I like it. I don't know why, I just do, because everybody else likes it. Um, and then uh, that also leads to groupthink, right? We, we like to think what others think. Um, there's gambler's glitch. 
Uh, I'm not going to have anybody tell on themselves. I'm not a big gambler, but I've definitely been in casinos. You know, we gamblers glitch. We give merit to things that have happened in the past. So think about a roulette wheel. Roulette wheel has 37 numbers on it. They spin the ball. The ball bounces around. It's completely random. But how many times have you been to the casino and you've walked up to that roulette wheel and you know they have the board, the digital board that shows all the previous rolls, and you might go up there and the last seven rolls have been red. And you may say, well, I'm going to put my money on red. But in reality, are the odds any better or worse that that ball is going to land on black or red every time that it's spun in the wheel? No. So, you know, that's a bias. Um, so let's, um, let's talk about, I think this is groupthink here. And that sun is something. You guys want any uh, sunscreen? No, thanks. They say sunscreen can cause as many problems as it solves. Yeah, we never said that. No, no, not you guys. I just mean, you know, generally people. But you said they say. Yeah. Right. We're they. <laughs> what? When people say they say, they mean us. I don't think you're... We're the people people mean when they say they. When they say they say. Right. So when someone says, they say, love is forever. <laughs> yeah, that's us. I remember that. We said that. It was right after Gary's divorce. It was meant to be ironic, but people took it seriously. How can they be just three of you? Actually, there's four of us. There's another guy in Bolivia. In Namibia. Right, I always get those two confused. Yeah, we Skype with him. Wait, hold on. What did you say they say uh, about the sunscreen? I said they say sunscreen can cause as many problems as it solves. That's some. What? Some say that. Different guys. Some are different than they. Yes. They say some don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> Wait. I just don't understand how the three of you could Four. be. Namibia. OK. Four of you. How everyone can just know what you say. We go to a lot of parties. OK, sure. I mean, you could spread, I guess, right? The whole six degrees of separation thing? What? Don't tell me you don't know that one. The six degree thing? You know, they say that, uh... <laughs> Jason Headley's got a lot of good stuff on YouTube. If you ever want to get more videos like this, he's, he's really funny. Um, but OK, so, to, so that's, you know, that's groupthink. Uh, to keep up with types of bias, uh, the, this is one that we are really great as uh, with law enforcement is after action rationalization, right? After I did something, that's the best thing I could have done because I did it. Uh, um, neglect of probability kind of is like gambler's glitch. Um, the status quo, this is another one. If we work in government bureaucratic organizations, the status quo is a, is a big bias that we encounter a lot, right? Why do we do things that way? Because we've always done them that way. But wait a second, boss, I found a more efficient way to do it that's gonna, gonna be better and have better outcomes. <laughs> Get that crazy nonsense out of here. We're not gonna talk about that. Um, there's negativity. Um, I'm a cop, I don't mind throwing stones. This is called day shift. Right? These are the guys that have been here for 25 years and are just waiting on retirement. Uh, but negativity manifests itself everywhere. Um, and then anchoring, if you've seen the movie As Good As It Gets, that's a good example of anchoring bias, right? It, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be here, and we might get a little bit better, we might get a little bit worse, but we're never going to drift from this spot too much. So these are types of biases that are not negative. They're, they're just going to be everyday present in our lives and, and we can think about. Um, but the important ones, particularly when we deal with victim populations, when we deal with sexual assault, child abuse, trafficking investigations, is we have to recognize that there are conscious biases, which we can be aware of, and then there are unconscious biases that we can be aware of, but they're going to impact us and we're not going to think about them when they're happening. So an example of this is heuristics, right? Our brain has to make billions and billions and billions of decisions every day, even when we're sleeping. It has to tell my heart to beat. It has to tell me to breathe. It has to tell me that I want to go to the bathroom. It has to tell me to put on clothes. It has to tell me to swallow, my stomach to digest. I mean, our brain's a busy, busy organ. Um, and it can't possibly consciously think about all of those decisions that it has to make. And so our brain develops little mental shortcuts, which are called heuristics, to help it make these decisions constantly. And so when you read these words on the screen, your brain isn't actually reading R-E-D, red. 
your brain just says that's red. And part of that is the heuristic in that that's the color that the word is. But if we flip it up a little bit, that's going to screw up with your brain. That's going to mess your heuristics. And I'll tell you, when I typed this slide, it was a while ago, I had the hardest time typing the word orange because the letters were in blue because it was screwing up that mental shortcut in my brain. Um, so heuristics are a really important form of bias that we need to be aware of. So let's do an experiment. This isn't a trick. I, I always get some smart aleck who's, who thinks it's a trick and gives like the third answer that's not an option. But just like the ice cream, okay? I'm going to show you two pictures. One of these people, these are pictures of people, one of these people is a convicted cattle thief. Okay? The answer is not none of the above. There's no trick on this. One of these people, cattle thief. Uh huh. What? Yeah. Yeah. What? What are they stealing Alabama? <laughs> okay. So one of these people is a convicted cattle thief. I'm going to show you the pictures. I want you to decide which one is the convicted cattle thief. Everybody ready? Okay. All right. Has anybody not made a decision? Okay. So, who did you pick? I'm going left. The left. So the, 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 the kid leaning up on the truck. Yeah. Okay. Why did you pick him? I don't know. He just looks like trouble. He, look, he looks like trouble. Okay. Anybody else pick him? Yeah. Why did you pick pick him? The other one looks like an established businessman. Say that again. He looks the one on the right looks like an established businessman. The one on the left looks like he'd be riding around getting in trouble. Okay. Okay. So by the show of hands, can I assume that everybody else who picked who picked the guy as we're facing it on the right? Raise your hands. Okay. And who picked the guy as we're facing it on the left? Show of hands. And who's not even here? Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, somebody else who, somebody who picked the guy on the right. Why did you pick him? Because he looks like he's old enough to have some fun and do some dumb stuff. Because he looks like he's old enough to have some fun and do some dumb stuff. Yeah. <laughs> what did you, what, hold on, who said that? He's wearing a black hat. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's the bad guy. Okay, anybody else? Anybody else got a different reason why they picked either one? No, it's not a trick. He looks greedy and manipulative. Which one? The, the guy on the right. He looks greedy and manipulative. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. The guy on the left is a young kid. It takes a little organization and a little more work to rustle a cat, cattle. So that's why I pick. When did you live in Texas? When did you live in Texas? Man, it's so... so <laughs> okay. I've actually... So everything that everybody has said, I've heard before. I've done this presentation a lot, and I've heard all of those reasons before. And that is actually one that comes up a lot in Texas, is they say, man, you can be no young cattle rustler. You know, like, that's hard work. We have actual rangers, cattle rangers, that investigate stuff in Saturday night. Yeah. 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 They go undercover to cattle auctions, and they can spot stolen cattle. How? I, I can't, we're going to have a day-long training on how to spot a trafficking victim, and you got people who are going, that cow's stolen. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, I've done this presentation a lot, and I will tell you that overwhelmingly, everybody is kind of the same breakup as what y'all have said. Everybody overwhelmingly chooses the guy on the right as the cattle, as the cattle thief. Um, the reality of it is, well, why, and we talked about why we picked, picked him. Okay, I, I made you make a decision, um, and you made that decision based off of the extremely limited information that you had, and it was completely based on bias, okay? And so you, you used the biases that you, that you had to make a decision with no information. So you may have done that with age, or I've had a lot of people say, like, he's leaning up against that truck, he looks like a punk, you know. The hat, that usually doesn't come up, but that's a legitimate thing, right? The color of the hat, because I'm old enough to remember in all the old westerns, right? 
the good guys wore white cowboy hats and the bad guys wore black cowboy hats. And that, that's, it's just a bias. It might not even be a conscious bias. It just might be something you remember as a kid and you go, well, that's what I think. But the reality of it is the younger guy is the convicted cattle thief. The older guy is just, I just Googled man in black cowboy hat. Um, so, so does that kind of give everybody an example though, how our bias is going to affect us as a service provider, as somebody that deals with victims, as somebody that, that, that does investigations, right? We're going to make these decisions. We're going to, we're going to impact our decisions based off of just what we think. And we may not have a legitimate rationale for why we think it. Yeah. The the yeah I, that's okay that's had everybody hear that? So the picture of the guy with the black cowboy hat was just clearer, and it was easy. You felt more informed maybe by that photo than you did from the other one. Oh, I see. Everybody thinks I'm trying to trick them. I don't know the cattle thief either. This I I really just Googled on this one, convicted cattle thief too, but. Um, so anyway, so that's an example of how bias affects us, right? So let's do another experiment, um, kind of more related to child stuff. You've got a child and he calls your administrative line to report a murder. He tells you that he's locked in a local restaurant with a mentally, uh, de or developmentally delayed man. And this kid has a history of making false reports before. Uh, do we believe it? Hmm? Has this ever happened before? Of course it's happened. Uh oh. And I want to report oh, murder. Wait a minute, wait a minute, just hold on here. Is that you again, Lawrence? Sheriff, look. It's time I'm telling you the truth. I'm locked inside the Vitelli's basement with this guy. <laughs> Rocky Road? <laughs> Yeah, like the time you told me about the 50 Iranian terrorists who took over all the scissor steakhouses in the city. Mark, get back here! Mark, please, Mark. Mark, Just like that last prank about all those little creatures that multiply when you throw water on them. Lawrence? Everybody knows who that movie's from, right? The Goonies. I hate this. So I've, I've done this presentation before, like, especially with a younger, a younger audience, mostly college kids, and they're like, we've never seen that. And it makes me feel old because Goonies came out in 1985. And uh, anyway, so, but it just brings up an example of, like, this is particularly applicable for um, trafficking investigations, but also I think for our family violence folks, if anybody does family violence, does it... Does it change the fact, if a person has come in and lied every other time, do we, does that mean that we know that they're lying this time? No. Now, could they be? For sure. And, you know, I'm not saying that they're telling the truth, but the bottom line is it comes down to as investigators, we have to do what? We have to investigate it, right? Because we don't know what we don't know, and we can't let our bias guide our investigations. Um, so bias isn't always bad, right? Like for cops, uh, there's a fight or flight bias. For everybody, there's a fight or flight bias. Um, you know, some people see this picture and they say, I gotta get out of the room. Other people like me, I could care less. So bias is just a part of our humanness and we have to acknowledge that. Um, all right, so what's the implicit bias, bias stuff and why do I care? So we've talked about how implicit bias is a developed set of heuristics, it's mental shortcuts. They're often unconscious, so we don't even know they're going on when we have to deal with them. Um, and they don't necessarily align with our outward beliefs. Uh, our counselors, people who routinely picked up the DSM, know what this is. Do anybody want to yell it out, what that is when our, 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 what we do doesn't align with our outward beliefs? It's like cognitive dissonance, right? So, and we, we can be guilty of that as good people all the time. Um, so that's important. All right, so prove it. Um, everybody in this room, can we agree has genitals and nipples? Okay, so every baby that's born has, I mean, and now I, like I said, there's always a smart aleck in here who's like, there's genetic deformities, but let's just talk about generally speaking. Every baby that's born has genitals and nipples, right? 
So every child, using that logic strain, has genitals and nipples, right? So are genitals and nipples bad? Absolutely not. Everybody's got them. Anybody disagree? Anybody want to say genitals and nipples are horrible? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, but do we talk to children about genitals and nipples? Routinely, normally? I mean, people outside of child abuse, just I'm talking about adults in general. <laughs> no, heck no. Like, we don't ever sit down with our kids and be like, how are your nipples doing, you know? I mean, I mean, <laughs> because that's what? That's weird. That's something we don't talk about. We, we don't talk about genitals and nipples so much with children that we don't even put them on their toys, right? Can you imagine how confusing that is for a child that's been abused, that's had somebody do something to their genitals and nipples, and then they got to come in and talk about them? I mean, and they're so awful subject matter, they're so taboo that we don't even put them on your toys, but we want you to come in and sit down with an interviewer and tell us all about what somebody did with your genitals. So that's a bias, and so we have to address that. Um, all right, have you, anybody who's interviewed anybody, particularly a meth-addicted person or a trafficking victim or a angsty teenager is going to understand this, but um, um, all right, you buy a new car. You've got your new car, and you've researched it, and you know all the specs on it, and you've paid for it, gotten your loan, however you've done this, and you just love it. You know everything about this car. You tell everybody about this car. You're so proud of it, and you just know it all. It's, it's, it's the coolest thing in your life. And then all of a sudden, you're parked at a conference in the museum, and somebody comes along and sideswipes it and, and leaves, us, leaves a mark on it. And um, you don't know how to do body work, and you probably don't have the, you may not have the money, you know, it's just a really bad time, and so you can't fix it. And then all of a sudden, that's all you think about it. So that beautiful new car that you were so proud of that you knew everything about all of a sudden becomes what in your mind? It just becomes a heap of junk, right? And that's, that's your bias because you don't know how to deal with the problem that's presented to you, so you just tune out, you just give up, you just say, well, it's, I, I don't love it anymore, it's not my favorite thing. You ever had this happen in a forensic interview? When you get a victim who like, I know that we're here to talk about Uncle Touchy, but we've been in here for two hours talking about everything but Uncle Touchy, and I have stopped listening an hour and a half ago. You know, particularly with your adult victims, that's, that's always a problem. So, you know, that's, that's a bias, that's, that's something that we need to be aware of. Um, so this is kind of what that looks like. You guys want some uh, water or tea? They seem pretty upbeat for uh, somebody who just had their computer stolen. Well, I've just never been robbed before. I'm just trying to be polite. Are you sure it wasn't an unfortunate yard sale? Yeah, yeah, it was a brand new iMac with retina display. Ooh, sounds pretty sexy. Uh, we flaunting it? No, it was right over there on the bureau. Oh, right here in front of this window. Flashing your goods for all the world to see? Kind of sounds like you were asking for it. I should be able to put my computer wherever I want. By filing a report, you're going to bring a lot of negative attention to this neighborhood and to yourself. I don't care. It's not my fault that this happened. The perpetrator should be the one getting the negative whoa, attention. Whoa, whoa, Are you yelling at us? <laughs> because that is exactly the kind of bad behavior that we can use against you in your report. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not yelling. Please investigate. Sure. Let's take a look around. No signs of forced entry. Nope. Locks intact. Yep. No broken windows. Do you have any physical evidence that you were robbed? Yes. I had a computer, and now I don't have a computer. Oh, let's not get cute, okay? How do I know that you didn't want someone to take your computer? Because I'm saying I didn't. Had you been drinking? I had a Bloody Mary at brunch, but I don't see why that matters. <laughs> wow. wow, wow, wow. Because if you were drinking, the courts are probably gonna side with the robber. That doesn't make any sense. Even if I was blackout drunk, I still have the right to a safe home. I think we're done here. Yeah. Wait, wait, what? Well, we need physical evidence in order to prove that you were robbed, and so far, we don't have any. Well, what about dusting for fingerprints? We could dust for fingerprints. Great, yeah, let's do that. But there is a backlog of 400,000 fingerprint kits that have yet to be processed, so uh, it's going to be a while. This is ridiculous. And even if we did find the perp at this point, it would be a real he said, he said thing. 
What? Yeah, so uh, you ready to drop this thing? Yeah. No, absolutely not. Someone was in here without my consent and they took something that I'll never get back. I feel violated. And by not doing something about it, you're letting him go free so he could do it to other people. Look, we can tell you're upset. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're gonna file a report, don't worry. If I was you, I'd uh, maybe get an alarm system, some security cameras, keep your blinds closed, hide all your valuables. Buy yourself a gun, take some self-defense classes, make sure you get a big dog, make sure the house is never alone. Oh, this whole system is set up against the victims! Hey, robbers will be robbers. I'd like that is. tea now. No, there's no tea here. Oh, water. Tea. Would be great. Matter water. You know, I mean, it's it's satire and it's drama, right? But we've seen all of that. Everybody's seen all of that at some point in an investigation, and um, those are kind of the biases that um, that can that can impact us. I know I, I keep repeating that, so I'm I'm trying to get to the solutions here real quick. Um, yeah, so we talk about our causes for bias. We've talked about heuristics, the mental shortcuts. Uh, we talk about bounded rationality, right? We create solutions limited by our bias. This is like what we talked about with the sock burns, okay? Um, you've got attribution. We assign causes to behavior. So this is the bias where you say, well, like, if you just stop doing meth, like, the reason why you're getting raped or you're being trafficked is because you're a meth head, right? Well, that's, you know, that's that. Um, and then there's that cognitive dissonance that our beliefs contradict. You know, I, I, and, and this is hard, especially from an advocacy perspective, right? I want to believe you. Everything in my heart, everything that I've been trained says I want to believe you, but everything in my mind says you're lying. That's really hard to reconcile, especially when you're doing one of these investigations. Um, so common, invi common issues that we deal with this in child abuse investigations, and remember, you know, trafficking is going to involve children a lot, okay, uh, is that age equals credibility. Now, for our folks that work in the CAC, is that true? No. I mean, no. I mean, I, kids tell the truth. They may not be able to tell it in the same way as an adult, but, you know, kids generally are as truthful as adults are. Um, you know, that cognition uh, is, it impacts the truth. Um, we assign attribution to victim and caregiver behaviors. These are, uh, um, you know, like grooming behaviors or, you know, well, this person didn't act like a victim. Um, and then we see this, we're going to talk about this later, about how victims of child sexual abuse particularly always give delayed, unconvincing disclosures. They test the waters, and which ultimately results often in a retraction or a recantation. So we have, if we're aware of that, we can deal with it. Um, so, so who uses these biases against us? It's, it's the abusers, it's the traffickers, it's the people that are committing these offenses. It, you know, if you, if you think about what you've been trained as just classic grooming behaviors, that's, that's bias. That's people using bias against us. I'm going to put myself in a position of authority or trust. I'm going to be a teacher, I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a clergy person, I'm just going to be the, the friendly guy in the neighborhood, and then I'm going to use people's biases so that I can go in and abuse their kids or steal their lawnmower or whatever you want to talk about. Um, so some case examples real quick just to give you, to show how this plays out in the real world. Um, like I said in the beginning, I was really fortunate that I transferred over to child abuse right when two of my detectives transferred over to child abuse. And so we got to learn together. We got to work cases together and it was great because we all were kind of nerdy pracademics and we like to, to digest this stuff in our heads. Well, we had a mom bring her five-year-old to the center and the five-year-old in a forensic interview out cried um, that her uh, caregiver's husband had shown her a movie and there were aliens that chased women around and white stuff shot out of their peepees. Now, if you work child sexual abuse, like that's a clue, you know, um, so we're probably a little bit more predisposed to believe that. But I'll tell you that um, the mom wasn't really convinced that something was going on and this little girl was, she, she went to a, a daycare at a church in town, it's the nice part of town, it's a really good church, um, this, and then when the church was closed, this lady would watch some children in her home. Um, she was elderly, her husband was elderly, they were both retired educators, um, they lived in the nice part of town, they were by all means just good, nice people, everybody's grandma and grandpa. But this kid came in and said this, and we went to lunch, I remember that day, and we kind of were hashing through it, like, all right, what's she saying? Because she's five, what's she saying? You know, there's no way that this is, this is the worst case scenario. And what we came up with in our head was the movie Aliens. Uh, everybody remember the movie Alien with Sigourney Weaver? And they're on that spaceship, and when the alien, the alien pops out of the dude's stomach, um, kind of looks like a penis. 
um, and then the alien grows up and it chases everybody all over that ship and it's it's always dripping some white stuff and it's flinging its tail and the white stuff is going everywhere and it's it's corrosive and it eats skin and metal you know everybody remembers and so we're like that's the dude must have been watching aliens and that's what this five-year-old is talking about because we said we let our bias of like cognition equals truth impact us but We'd also drank the Kool-Aid, we'd taken the blue pill, we'd gone down the rabbit hole, and we understood epistemology, and we said, well, let's investigate. And so we wrote a search warrant for these folks' house. We learned a valuable lesson. If you are law enforcement, if you are a detective, you probably know this lesson already. Do we ever, ever, ever execute a search warrant in the afternoon? Somebody nod their head, no. Absolutely not, no. We never go do a search warrant in the afternoon because you're gonna be there all night. You do that stuff in the morning so you can get done, go to lunch, go tag evidence, make your reports, go home. So we, we went about three o'clock in the afternoon, knocked on these folks' door. They were so nice. They met us in the yard. They, they wanted to give us coffee. They invited us inside. And when we got inside, we took over 100 computer devices out of that man's home. Now, I'll tell you, if you got 100 computer devices, you're doing one of two things. You're either mining Bitcoin or you're collecting child pornography. And in this case, he was collecting child pornography. But on one of those computer devices, the home screen was this. Now, I've sanitized this, obviously. But the home screen was this, and this was a screenshot out of a pornographic movie that he had on this device, where this man, dressed up as an alien, chases women around and has sex with them and ejaculates on them. And so that's it. this little five-year-old was describing exactly what she had seen. And if we had let our biases come into play and never run that search warrant, we never would have known it. And I guarantee you what this man was doing was grooming her to sexually assault her, okay? And um, so he ended up, we found thousands of images of child porn. This, this man was a pornography collector, all sorts of pornography. Um, but, you know, you think about the worst case, if we had let our biases impact us, how would that have changed the outcome of this? And so we've got to think about stuff like that. Um, I've kind of altered this presentation a little bit to be more trafficking focused. We, in, in, let me give you some background on this real quick too. In McLennan County, we had a really successful case as one of our first. We had the first ever conviction for trafficking of persons in McLennan County. Um, it's, not, I'm not, it's not just our success, it's everybody's success. Um, Andre Evans was given 12 consecutive life sentences for trafficking of persons. So. I think that's good, you know. Once he dies, he's got to do it again 11 times. Um, we bring him back to CPR. Okay? <laughs> Two, three. But this was about the same time, and the victim in this case, uh, the victim in this case was, she'd been in um, CPS placement her entire life. She was removed at birth from her parents. She'd been in RTC after RTC residential treatment center. She'd been in placement her entire life. She'd run. She'd been sexually abused by an adoptive family. Um, she had done drugs. I mean, she was just your typical, you know, uh, kid that the system has kind of let down. And she ended up in Waco. The only connection she had to Waco was that she got placed in an RTC in Waco. She ran. She got picked up by the student trafficked. And, and we were really good at not letting our biases impact us. And we picked her up. I'm going to tell you that I've had to change the voices in this. So I think I sound super cool. I sound like Darth Vader in this. It's awesome. Um, but listen to her words, OK? Listen to her words and think about how our biases could have, could have impacted us. My name's Sergeant Lundquist. I've never met you, OK? But I've been, we've been looking for you. I don't know why. <laughs> well, how old are you? I can take care of myself. I'm not, I'm, I'm just, I'm just a little 13 year old foster girls getting right. raped that, that haven't been caught. So all the other people that don't get caught, my own work does not work for them. Hey, I'm not So kidding. just go help all the little 13 year old girls. I'm doing perfectly fine. I'm not out on the street. I wasn't cold. I was sitting on the couch. I had blanket. I had shoes on earlier. I, I'm eating. I'm perfectly fine. I'm safe. I'm not doing anything wrong. What the fuck is wrong with what I'm doing? Hey. I'm in CPS because somebody else did something, just not me. So can y'all just leave me alone and I'm let me saying, be on my own? I'm not saying you did anything wrong. Nobody's saying you did anything wrong. Just stop looking for me then. What's the big deal? Every time they look for me, if I'm going and running away again, I'm just, obviously they might want to get the picture. I'm not going to stay. Well, they we put me in the most locked down facility for CPS kids. I got out of that placement. Well, so I'm this not, is gonna put me right back in. Jessica, I'm not gonna out. let the I'm not gonna let these guys run around and do the things with you that they're doing. Okay, it ain't about you, it's about them because I put them in jail. Nobody's doing anything to me that I haven't 
been okay with lately. Okay, well. And when they did do stuff to me, how do you know what's gonna happen tomorrow? Caught. How do you know what's gonna happen tomorrow? Okay. And how do you know they didn't get caught? Okay, well, just because of my age, you can't say that. Then you need to put every single woman in the placement that I'm in because you never know what's gonna happen hey, tomorrow Jessica, or little quick. boys. Hey, real quick, what was your birthday again? Did anything she say there was that wrong? Does anybody disagree with anything she said? I mean, she's, she's speaking some truth. She was 15 at the time. She's speaking some truth. She was also addicted to meth. She was also a constant chronic runaway. Um, how easy would it have been for us or for me to just say, F you then, shut the door, take her to juvenile like we've done a million other times and not ask the questions. But did anybody hear the one thing she said in there? I, every time I listen to that, it always sticks with me. Did, did anybody hear anything in there that really stuck with them? Sir? Yeah, so we were, um, so we had gotten a report. We knew that she was being trafficked. Um, we knew that she was in Waco and we had gotten a report from honestly, a really honest John who said, hey, the, my madam, the lady who, who sends me prostitutes, told me that he had a new girl, and I went over and I saw her, and I know that she's the girl that y'all are looking for, because we had put her information out and her picture out in the media. And so we went over there and got her, and she was with this, this madam. She kind of just let her stay in her apartment, um, and, and, you know, and the condition was she had to bring some money in, and she did that by having sex with, with men. This is not... She's escaped the trafficking situation of Andre Evans at this point. So we're just recovering the victim. In that conversation, um, I'm kind of asking her like, hey, what's going on? And she's complaining that, um, uh, just stop looking for me, right? I've been a chronic runaway my entire life. I've been okay. I've survived. I was okay here. She says, you know, I was warm. I was on a couch. I had food in my belly. Like, just stop looking for me. Leave me alone. Stop caring. Um, and then she goes on to say, when I tell her, hey, I'm not here to talk about the things that you've done. I'm here because I'm not okay with the things that people have done to you. And she says, well, then you're going to have to take every woman out there in a situation like mine and lock her up and put her in placement, you know, um, and she's right. But the thing that always strikes me about that conversation, and I don't know if, it, if you picked up on it, is she said, nobody's done anything to me that I haven't been okay with lately. Which means what? People have done things to me that I haven't been okay with. It just hasn't been lately. And so I'm good. I don't need your help. You can leave me alone. Well, what she was talking about was Andre Evans kept her uh, naked in a back room. Andre was like the dope man and you could come buy dope from his house and then you could have sex with this girl that was in the back room for a little bit more money. And she tells us the story that he, he got her doped up on heroin to the point that she doesn't know how long she was there, how many days. And she said that so many men were coming to have sex with her that she didn't even bother putting on her clothes. She just stayed naked in that house because there were so many people that Andre was allowing to come have sex with her. So that's what she wasn't okay with. And, and when I talk about our bias, our bias could have said, hey, you know what, you're a foul mouth kid. Every foul mouth kid I've ever dealt with doesn't outcry. Every foul mouth kid that's addicted to meth I've ever dealt with always runs from their placement. I never get to see him again. I spend, I do all this work on these cases and they go nowhere. Close the door, go to juvenile. I mean, how many times have we done that or wanted to do that? And if we had done that in this case, we would have never gotten that information. And so that's how your bias can, can come to play in a juvenile sex trafficking investigation. I hope that we're starting to like get down to the bottom of the funnel with this, because I'm not trying to be, I know we're all done with nerding, right? Everybody wants to hear Joe. So, so how do we deal with this? How do we deal with our biases? How do we deal with our epistemological limitations? We have to recognize them. And I think we've done a, a good discussion so far on how we do that. We, if we're aware of them, then we can address them. Um, and then we have to examine our actions in context. Whenever you do anything as a service provider, as an investigator, just ask yourself, is this leading to the outcome that I want to happen? Or is it just my biases coming into play? So question our judgments, you know, and, but go back to what we talked about from the beginning. Distinguish your justified opinion from, from your beliefs. Distinguish fact from opinion. Um, so how do we do this? Uh, utilize your best practice techniques. 
Uh, we're going to talk later, but one of the best practice techniques in a juvenile sex trafficking investigation is to utilize your CAC model because your CAC model has best practice techniques that are researched and recognized and been used for a long time. So use those best practice techniques. Use plain language. Um, as a cop, I'm guilty of this, and I try and correct it and correct it with the people I work with as much as I can, but how many times do we get those reports that say, on such and such date, I thenceforth and therefore did for remove myself from my patrol car, walk around the front bumper, and immediately and thenceforth move to and meet a woman who I shall forever, forever be known as Maria Sandoval, date of birth, blah, 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 blah. Um, I mean, it's, we put so many words in stuff. I saw a report come through the other day, I just added this, and I thought, man, this is exactly what I'm talking about. This was a new troop, and they did a really good job making a report on a sexual assault. But they said that the girl confessed to her mom about the sexual assault. And then they said that the girl confessed to the advocate about the sexual assault. Does anybody recognize the bias, they see the problem in that, right? What do we confess to? Crimes, crimes. Okay, I don't mind telling you, I'm Catholic. What, is anybody else in the room? You don't have to raise your hand, but if you're Catholic, what do we confess to as Catholics? Sins, right? Through my fault, through my fault. And so just by using that verbiage, we've assigned a bias to the victim. So these are things that we need to be careful of when we, when we do stuff. Be open-minded. And so be analytical, you know, and being analytical means be systemic, uh, or systematic, scientific, and logical. So try something. Does it give you the outcome that you desired? If it doesn't, go back. Try something else. Does it give you the outcome that you desired? If it doesn't, go back. So that's, that's kind of how we can counteract these things. Narrow your scope and your focus. Um, if anybody's done a trafficking investigation or even a child sexual abuse investigation, like these are messes. I'm on call all the time and I get the calls from our patrol folks who go, oh man, I got a mess. And I'm like, that's what we do. You know, we deal with messes. And the way we deal with messes is we deal with one problem at a time. What's the problem that needs dealt with right now? I, I understand there's all these others, but we're going to deal with this one, and then we'll move on to that one. Don't get yourself up in the weeds and then just get nothing accomplished. Um, so, this is funny. I say, what are the most dangerous words that a police officer can say? And I did this class um, kind of for college students that were in law enforcement one time, and you know what they said? Show me your hands. <laughs> and I'm like... Yep. <laughs> okay, that's right. But from our perspective as practitioners, as law enforcement, does anybody, to the cops in the room, does anybody have an opinion as to like, what are the most dangerous words that we can say as cops? Um, what's that? Yeah, that's, that's kind of going in the direction I want to go. Anybody? Anybody got any other ideas? Like I said, everybody looks down. Oh, crap, he's coming over to me. What's that? So I think these are the most dangerous words that we can say as cops through my training and experience. Do we say that a lot? Yes. Yes, we say that a lot. What do you have to have if you're going to say through my training and experience? Right. <laughs> you ever said that when you didn't have it to justify what you did? I, I have. I mean, I don't, mind, I don't mind calling myself out. I know Joe has, you know. So just make sure if you say these things that you've actually got them. Um, cause you're prosec who's the prosecutor? You're gonna, you're gonna make sure that that plays out, aren't you? That can make you look really bad on the stand, but it'll make you look really bad just in the, in the whole sense of everything. If you're gonna say that, you need to have it. It goes back to the whole gambler's glitch, right? You know, just cause something has happened a million times before doesn't mean you can say it this time. Um, so never be afraid to say these three important words related to our epistemology and our bias when it comes to an investigation, right? I don't know. These are hard words for people that are smart to say. These are hard words for cops to say and advocates and nurses and doctors. I mean, we spent all of our lives getting smart and then to go in there and go, I don't know, but it's okay. It's okay. And you'll get a lot of credit from your victims, even kids, uh, when you say those things. You know, another thing too that like we use I used to think they were corny, and, um, and then I got into child abuse. But one of the things that we use is mission statements and core values. Because I've got a, a Texas statute book that's like this thick, and I've got a department policy manual that's equally as thick. And there's a lot of times that the answers aren't in those. And then it's like, well, what do I do? 
You know, I don't know if I'm making the right decision. I don't know whether it's, there's not a policy that tells me what to do. There's not a law that tells me what to do. How do I know what to do? Well, I can go back to the mission statement and I can say, you know, am I providing my police service to the community with professionalism, accountability, uh, integrity, and respect? You know, am I being a faithful steward of the public's trust and resources? Am I acting in the interest of children and justice? Um, am I being an impartial fact finder? Am I serving as a part of a larger team? If the answer to any of those are no, just go back. Okay, don't do that. Let's try something else. Try and get to our goal. So things like this can help you. They seem corny, but in the, in the grand scheme of things, they will help you with your bias and your, and your epistemology. Um, and then we can use other things like just kind of current popular hashtags, right? I'm a big believer in the hashtag start by believing. Now, does that mean that I believe everybody? Absolutely not. But what does start by believing look like in practice? Okay. Um, somebody give me some examples of what start by believing looks like. Terry, I'm coming to you. I know you want to tell me. The first thing I thought of was going into a situation with the possibility that this, what you're hearing is, is the truth. Keeping an open mind. Yes. Right. Anybody else? All right. I'm going to start picking on people. What do you think start by believing means? For, what, do you, what do you do? What's your discipline? What, what do you do? Okay, awesome. So as a student, what does start by believing mean to you when it comes to sexual assault or trafficking? Right. Just belief. Excellent. Um, prosecutors, what does start by believing mean to you? So that's the key word there, and that's, I'm glad that we got there. But the, um, for law enforcement, anybody tell me if we disagree with this, but start by believing, I think, is hard for law enforcement. Because start by believing has deeper implications for us than it does for a student. Because for her, her start by believing is just exactly what you said, right? I, I, I will believe you. But for us, start by believing means I will believe you in the fact that I will do an investigation. And so that means that I will do a safe exam, even if I don't think I believe you. That means that I will call a forensic interviewer in after hours, even if I don't think that I, I, I believe you. you know, that means that I will go out and run a search warrant on a residence, even if I'm not sure that this happened, right? Because I need, if I don't do this stuff, I'll never figure it out. So that's kind of, there's more of a burden for stuff like that on us, but it guides us and it helps us get past our biases. Okay, I'm done. Um, so we'll have these up throughout the, the day, but this is my contact information. Um, the top is my work email address. Uh, like I said, I've been a cop 21 years, which makes me retirement eligible. So if that one ever bounces back, then my personal's on the bottom. Um, but again, I love honest feedback. So do we want to take a break, guys? Grace? Yes, we'll take about a 15 minute break. We have drinks over here in the little Coca-Cola bin or feel free to use the bathroom, which are downstairs and down the hallway to the right. And we'll meet back at 10.15.